one of the uh, one of the great joys of coming over to Tim's is that <laughs> there is always something on the television when I walk in. Mm. In this case, it's Under Fire. Yes. Which you, Roger Spottiswood, uh, which you, you know you, you you forget what Under Fire is like, and uh, and here I am looking at uh, Joanna Cassidy Joanna and Nick Cassidy, Nolte and, the and, and, and and Jean Louis Trintignant. I forgot that he was even in, in this. the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so crazy. Uh, yeah, yesterday, uh, Jackie Bissett and Nick Nolte. Yeah. Uh, Lugosi Jr. Uh, there, uh, uh, the Deep. The Deep. Yeah. You know, which was, yeah. Yeah, I had forgotten what that movie was about. <laughs> that I, for, was... I had forgotten it was really about those ampules of uh, uh, morphine. You know, they, 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 they yeah. about that morphine down there. I was yeah. like, oh, that's interesting. I forgot yeah. about that. Because, you know, they were looking for gold or treasure. Yeah. Well, but, that was in that moment when, after Jaws had succeeded, everyone thought, uh, Peter Benchley, what else does he have? Yeah. Because yeah. they thought that the reason Jaws succeeded was because of Peter Benchley. Yeah, not the. Th- <laughs> which is the same delusion they had after The Godfather, where yeah. they thought, oh, this is Mario Puzo. He's got a thing. No, no, no. no. These are bad novelists. Yeah, they were these fixed are, these by better filmmakers. Fixed by, that's it. These are bad novelists who wrote bad novels that just simply had a germ of something in them that a filmmaker could turn into gold. Yeah, yeah. Take the pulp out of it. That's and, it. And, and that's and, 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 it. Yeah, eventually, yeah. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. Well, I should say I'm very happy because uh, my, the the Women's World Cup turned out uh, <sighs> could not have turned out better for me. Yeah. I I will say this. I wish the American women this time out had had a little bit less swagger. They certainly deserve to have it. Yeah. Uh, a back to back back to back World Cups is is no, nothing to slouch at. There was a but there was a little bit too much like cockiness well, in them in, for me in, in, this in, year. In, but me, I'm thrilled they won. Yeah, the thrill they won. You know what? Swag if you want to. But here's the thing: um, if you hadn't engaged in so much swag, then you and I wouldn't be talking about that right now. Yeah. We'd be talking about how, what yeah. badass. You know, yeah. we'd only be, be talking about That's that. That's probably true. And and there wouldn't be even a drop of that. Besides that, particularly on the on, on you know on the two in a row. Mm-hmm. Now you should kind of be acting like you've been here. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You, you know, just just be cool. Which is which is what Charles Barkley always said yeah. to to the rookies. You know, don't don't celebrate after yeah. a dunk. Yeah. Act like you've been act, there. Act like you've been here. You, yeah. You, a, yeah. Now I'm sorry. I'm a I'm a big yeah. fan of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I am too. Yeah, I am too. Uh, I think I think Walter Payton used to say something similar about scoring touchdowns. You know, Payton was never like an end zone celebration guy. Mm-mm. I catch it, I score my touchdown, go back. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just, it's it's my job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that that certainly thrills me. Uh, I was elated that they wound up in the final against the uh, the Dutch women. I have three favorite teams in men's and women's. Mm. U.S., mm. France, Netherlands, in that order. Mm. So it breaks my heart that the U.S. had to win the championship by beating France and the Netherlands yeah. and England because yeah. um, I love all those teams. But uh, you know what? I, I think the I think all those teams performed well. I think they're going to get more investment in their programs. And I think this World Cup really is going to change FIFA uh, despite all the equal pay discussion, which mm. most people don't seem to understand, there are really interesting nuances to it. But I think FIFA is going to cut loose some checks and uh, and help develop the women's game in uh, in South in uh, South America, mm. in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in places where the countries haven't really invested significantly in it. And I think that's a great thing. Yeah, so for, for me, it's kind of a simple thing. And I, I understand what people talk about. Uh, you know, you know, you have to look at uh, box office receipts and uh, and tennis. Tennis yeah. is my Attendance, favorite yeah. sport. You know, the three sets opposed to five. You know, all, yeah. you know, all this, all this kind of stuff. But here's the thing, uh, and this is true in, in, in uh, you know, between soccer, men's soccer, women's soccer. I'm sorry, women's soccer is a far and away more entertaining game. Much more, much more much entertaining more. sport than men's soccer. Same because they don't tennis. fake it. Yeah, you know, they, they, it's, <laughs> they it's, it's, it's it's a strategic game. It's a tactical game, but it still has strength and speed. Yep. Um, uh, same thing in uh, women's tennis, a far and away more yeah. interesting uh, sport than yeah. men's tennis. Men's tennis is about how hard can I hit it? How hard can you hit it back? Yeah. That's pretty much all they're doing on the men's I, side of the game. I, I, I'm sorry. One of the most entertaining, it might even be the most entertaining. I mean, apart from the legendary Borg McEnroe finale at the, at the U S open way mm. back. Otherwise the, the, there was a, uh, 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 was it a Wimbledon final? It was mm-hmm. the Wimbledon final between uh, Serena no. and and uh, and uh, and uh, our Russian girl. Oh, uh, uh, um, uh, oh, the, yeah, yeah, the Russian girl, uh, uh, the beautiful. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Why can't oh, I think of her name? Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Sharapova, Maria, Sharapova, Maria, Maria Sharapova. There was a Maria. And I haven't seen her in a while. Mar- as well, because she's been she's yeah. been off the grid because yeah. they unfairly banned her for a year, or whatever. But but Maria and and Serena had a final. That was one of the most phenomenal things I've ever seen. It was like, 
it would these rallies of like 20 and 30 strokes kissing the corners yeah and just running and running and running and it was just it was amazing it was really a it was a breathtaking thing to watch and we all know serena speaking of her will be as we tape this yeah. as she has made another final uh-huh. uh, and she will play against simona Halep. yeah uh, and, and it's really sort of funny because this 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 run no one's been talking about Serena. I know. For one thing, we were all this kid named Coco Goff. This American yeah, I kid know. named Coco. She's amazing. Yeah. She's, She's amazing. Fifteen. You know, fifteen looks exactly like <laughs> Venus I when know. Venus was fifteen. Yeah. Uh, which is really and, and took Venus out in that first round, of course. But Crazy. so we've been talking about her and a few yeah. other people. So Serena has been very, very able to very stealthily work her way uh, through to another final while playing doubles. Yeah. With Andy Murray. Crazy, right? I just love it. I, just I know love it's it. crazy. Yeah, you know, it's fantastic stuff. All right, now well, the sports report is over. Let's sports talk about yeah, movies. Getting into the movies, and uh, so w- one thing that we should probably talk because this I, this was interesting. I listened to you on Film Week last week when you uh, gave me credit for being a, uh, an editor, ah. uh, which was hilarious because I've always thought I was a terrible <laughs> editor. No, uh, but. Um, uh, you, you talked about uh, the new Spider-Man mm-hmm. and Mary Jane and Zendaya's Mary Jane. Yeah, and, oh, and that and uh, Zendaya's great, but oh. should not play Mary Jane. No, Mary Jane's a little redhead, and there's yes. a reason she's a little redhead. And 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 by the way, I in that in that in that uh, animated Spider-Man, yeah, in your different Spider Verse, yeah. So you got another Spider Miles, yeah, and there are, and there are Peter Parkers. So and here's Peter the question: Parkers have Mary Janes, and they're all redheads. So that you know, on that subject, there's another bit of casting which is interesting because Zendaya last year, for a moment, was talked about as the lead in the Little Mermaid live action. Hmm. Wound up not being her. Winds up being Halle Bailey. Oh yeah, from the Disney Channel, who is a singer, who's you know uh, kind of an acolyte of uh, Beyonce, yeah. and uh, from the Chloe X Halle uh, yeah. duo with her sister. Yeah. So um, that's that's kind of turned up a thing. People are like, wait a minute, uh, you know, Ariel's a, a, a redhead white girl, and you just you just cast a black girl as as the as uh, Ariel. How's how's that's how's that working? There's a whole hashtag, not my Ariel, emerging. <laughs> It, which is in it, and a lot of people like a lot of people are, are jumping all over that, saying you're being really, really unfair, and so forth. Now, your thoughts about that? I'm curious. That, yeah, I, that one I have no trouble with. Okay, uh, and there, there's a reason why I have no trouble with that one. For, it, it, but, but if I had my druthers, what you would have done is given the character a different name, uh, and and then let her exist in the world. Yeah. Of the little mermaid yeah. people, and yeah. there, and there's another Ariel, and she's over there, and she's in the. <laughs> to, to me, I, I do not like the idea of these things usurping one thing for the other, just yeah. sort of arbitrarily. Now, it's, but I'm, I'm going to live with that one, and, and, and I'll tell you why. But as opposed to sometimes we talk about the Bonds. I mean, they talk about yeah. the James Bonds for a while. Yeah. They talk about Idris Elba. And all. No, <laughs> James Bond is not a brother. He <laughs> just isn't. And by the way, Shaft. Is not a white dude, <laughs> and the reason why we shouldn't do these things for, for, for the exact same reasons, you know. See, now here's here's where I came in on this, and I mentioned this on our Facebook page, and and uh, the the problem here is because there is a an animated thing that exists in the world, and then a live action version of it that mm. people have expectations about. Now Disney has played fast and loose, and they've been faithful and not so faithful with with, with some of these to varying degrees, as we talked about with Dumbo, right? Mm. The live action Dumbo has got no mouse. It's got a dad and some kids that were not in the animated. Like that, that's all switched up. Mm-hmm. It's a completely different story. The only thing that is it has an elephant with floppy ears that flies. That's about the only thing in it that's the same. Uh, Beauty and the Beast was one hundred percent faithful. Yeah, like, almost uh, faithful to the to, to a to, fault. To the, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Cinderella. Cinderella's got no mice in it. You know, there's no 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 bibbity bobbity boo. There's none of that. You know, mm-hmm. like Cinderella, the brand the brand of live action Cinderella takes a lot of liberties mm-hmm. and changes the story a little bit too. So the question is, how far how far afield are they intending to go with this Little Mermaid? We don't really know yet. We know the music will be there. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure the live action Milan has the music in it. Do you know? No, do you know if they're doing I it do, as a musical I, I or not, straight? I, 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 in my mind, they're doing it straight. Uh, yeah. So no music. So no music for See, them. See, that's yeah. an interesting switch up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and the Chinese are still pissy about it. So yeah, you know, yeah, you know what? You know, yeah. there, there, there was a Michelle Yeoh Milan that they had some years ago that didn't do well, and I think they're upset that their version yeah. didn't do anyway. Yeah. But but the uh, the thing that I found interesting is this, and this is because I have a daughter who loves Ariel. That was her first movie, her first you know princess. And my daughter has red hair, not that red, but it's red hair, and she's very aware of it, and she's very proud of her red hair. Mm-hmm. And the reason she gravitated to Ariel was because Ariel had red hair just like her. Mm-hmm. And I've read a lot of people. The issue with casting Halle Bailey 
is not that they've cast a black actress. It's that Ariel needs to have red hair. Red hair, yeah. Because gingers catch such flack in the world. Mm-hmm. And we are, you know, we are the butt of everybody's joke, and we're this and we're that, and, you know, you get... So to erase them and is, is diminishing. They feel, they felt like Ariel's hair mattered. Yeah. Like in the animated film, it mattered, and, it sh- and they were waiting for a live-action Ariel to be a live-action redhead, and that's a disappointment to them. And I think that's really interesting. Now, I had not thought of that. So, so I was called on the carpet about my Zendaya thing, and some kids said to me yeah. exactly that. What if Zendaya, in that, in that uh, live-action version of Mary Jane, had red hair? In other words, she just had dyed red hair. Yeah. If on screen, that's still Zendaya, but her hair is red because, you know, people do that yeah. with their hair. I'm sitting on you. I'm kind of blondy right yeah. now. Uh, and you, would, would you still be upset because you said it was because Mary Jane was a little redhead? Now, yeah. now, you, I, and I and I specifically said that I didn't say that because Mary Jane was white. I yeah. didn't she's say a redhead. That. I said she was a redhead, and there's even a reason why she's a yeah. redhead. Um, and so I had so I had to I had to take a beat, you know, yeah, and, and think to myself, you know, it really is the hair, yeah. that I'm having the issue with, yeah, and that's the reason why I was going to say okay for the Little Mermaid because I was yeah. going to I was going to say my suggestion is. That's actually the thing, guys. Yeah, the coconut shells too are an issue, but uh, the, the, <laughs> but the but the but the red hair. So if it's a little black girl, a Latina girl, whatever, and you and you and you and you give them the crucial feature, yeah, of the character, I think I can live with that. Yeah, and the, and the funny thing is, I guarantee you that my daughter, when she sees the Little Mermaid live action, they, they will have absolutely no problem with it. She'll be like, "Oh, well, that's an interesting take on it." You know, I probably yeah. prefer the animated. That's how she feels about Beauty and the Beast. She saw the live action. She enjoyed it. She watched it a few times on Blu-ray. She's gone back to the animated. Yeah, yeah right. But, but, but so, that is the crucial take. You know, yeah. Just make the kids red hair. Make the kids hair, and, you know, and then it, I the, think we'll be the, okay. The bottom line, too, is that the one does not make the other one cease to exist. Exactly. Uh, and I have a bigger problem with the director they chose for The Little Mermaid. <laughs> but uh, but you know the and I have a bigger problem too with the way that Disney is revising some of their movies. Uh, well, there's some revision in Mulan, some of which is necessary. Well, not even that. The fact that you uh, we should let people know now that if you have an old Older edition, an older Blu-ray of Toy Story 2. Hang on to it, because the vi- the version that to- that Disney just recently released. Oh, of the same film. Of the same film, they secretly scrubbed part of the uh, the outtakes over the credits. There used to be an outtake over the end credits where uh, the the character that uh, that uh, uh, Fraser Kelsey Grammer voices oh, yeah. uh, is having a conversation with two Barbies. Ah. And it felt very me too. Okay. They took it out. Okay. It's part of the original film. Uh, they yeah. have, they well, have, you know, man. you know, that, that ain't cool. Man, it's, that it's, ain't cool. It's, 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 it's a thing we're going to have to deal with, though. I mean, I understand yeah. some of Eddie Murphy stuff is going to go away. Uh, in that See, movie, can't, um, can't, you got You got You got to leave that stuff as is. You got to own it. You got to own it. It's part of history. You can't. You can't uh, sanitize these things. Well, anyway, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get into the DVDs and Blu-rays now. We have uh, rambled enough. We hope everybody had a good holiday here in the U.S. Everybody overseas, hoping uh, that you're having a great summer. It is scalding here now. We finally have a summer. The earthquakes have calmed down a bit. This, this, you know, this, since last we spoke, we had yeah. two fairly in- interesting earthquakes. I didn't feel the first one. I sure felt the well, second that one. That second one, boy, man, yeah, that, was- that was crazy. That was crazy. Uh, seven point one, and it was one hundred and twenty miles away, and we thank felt goodness. It. You know, yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, of course, we were here for the for N- Northridge for, quake, for the big Northridge, yeah. you know, right under the city. But nevertheless, Ooh. well, all right, gonna uh, jump into some anime here real quickly. Uh, got a whole man. The anime is just going fast and furious. This is one of these areas that is just uh, off the off the hook still with Blu-ray and DVD. So I don't know how long that's going to stick around, but boy, I'll tell you, it, it, it's Fast and Furious. Pet Shop of Horrors, complete collection from Sente. Uh, what an absolutely beautiful piece of art this is. Uh, I mean, it is it is it is eerie and creepy and, and very, very uh, uh, edgy in terms of story. Um, but wow, I'll tell you, just visually, this thing is a real stunner. It is a real, real stunner. Um, the, uh, the, the story itself is like supernatural noir. Uh, you know, this, uh, you, you have to, um, there's a, there's a pet shop, a pet shop in Chinatown and run by a guy named Count D. And, uh, what, what you, what you get in this pet shop is, um, 
uh, a little nightmarish. It's it, you you know it is it is literally the pet shop of horrors, and it, it, it's not where you know you're not getting a cute little puppy here. You're getting something very very different, and uh, the uh, it's it, I guess this feel I guess you could say like if this were this is maybe an anime version of. Uh, of a of a Dashiell Hammett story with a uh, a ghoulish um, supernatural overlay to it. It's but the artwork is just it's to die for. It really is to die for. It's really really fantastic. Uh, I I highly urge even people who don't necessarily like anime check this out. Pet Shop of Horrors. Some really extraordinary animator animators are uh, are doing some work on this. Uh, we also have uh, Asura Cryan. This is from Made in Japan, uh, and uh, it, it's not as great an artwork. This is also supernatural. It's all kinds of uh, ghosts and uh, parallel realities and universes and uh, uh, monsters and, and, you know, things from beyond. I, um, uh, you know... Uh, yeah, I, I it's it felt it feels super derivative, and that most of that has to do with because everything is kind of launched through the high school experience again. I don't, I, I think because the people who watch this are high school age kids, so they want to feel like they're empowered. But it uh, it's a little bit a um, little bit familiar and kind of hard to comprehend. Mm. Um, from uh, Shout Factory and G Kids, who are doing a lot of anime now is uh, Mind Game. This is uh, from Studio 4C and the director Masaki Yuasa. That's M-A-S-A-A-K-I, Masaki Yuasa, whose work I think we've talked about in the past. I'm pretty sure that we have. I haven't, uh, you know, he's he's listed here as having done Devilman Crybaby, and I don't remember ever covering that. But um, very, very interesting style, very interesting sensibilities, not standard anime. Uh, it's anime only because uh, Yuasa is, in fact, Japanese. But everything else about this is, uh, is very avant-garde, very unusual, really kind of pushing the envelope on all kinds of new aesthetic concepts. Um, the um, the, the storyline is very new age. Uh, it, it, you know, it goes into the afterlife and, uh, you're, you, God plays a part in this thing as well. And there's all kinds of really, really weird, surreal stuff going on. It's almost no, more, um, almost more, uh, kind of classic surrealism, uh, than anything else. It really is a very, very unusual approach to animation. It's unique in the world of anime. Again, anime only because the, the uh, director and the central conceptual artist is in fact, uh, Japanese. And then we have, uh, from Right Stuff, we love the people at Right Stuff, one of the, uh, one of the great, uh, ongoing anime houses, and you can get all their stuff at rightstuffanime.com, rightstuffanime.com, and, uh, this is, uh, ongoing, uh, installment of the Gundam universe, this is Mobile Suit Gundam, The Origin, Chronicle of the Loom Battlefield. If you are not completely immersed in the world of Gundam, nothing here will make any sense to you. Don't even try. <laughs> Honestly, don't even try. It's it, you know, Gundam spans many centuries and and billions of light years, and it's just it, it's it's an enormous universe. It's bigger than Star Wars. It's bigger than Lord of the Rings. There's just a lot of stuff going on. This takes place in the uh, Universal Century 0079. And uh, it's it's effectively kind of an apocalyptic uh, situation now between the uh, principality of Zeon and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the operate. Well, I won't even get into it. It's, there's no point. Uh, the uh, but it is it is uh, what it basically is is kind of an allegory for the uh, end of the British Empire in the 19th century, the end of the British Maritime Empire kind of at the tail end of colonialism. It's an interesting allegory in that sense. It is Mobile Suit Gundam, the origin chronicle of the Loom Battlefield. Really, really very interesting. And uh, go to rightstuffanime.com for that one. And we've also got, uh, also from G Kids and Shout, something a little more standard anime and really charming. Akko's Inn, O-K-K-O, Akko's Inn. Really beautiful traditional anime, uh, very rooted and steeped in Japanese culture, but they go out of their way to have an ethnically diverse collection of characters in this thing, uh, which I thought was very, very interesting. Really wanted to kind of push the envelope on that and give it a sense of uh, universality. 
And it's got, you know, big eyed kids. It looks, it's kind of in the style of Pokemon and stuff like that. It, it wants to be, it wants to skew a lot younger. And um, it's about this, uh, this little girl who has lost her parents in a car accident, moves to the countryside, very standard, typical Japanese countryside, to um, live with her grandmother at this kind of bed and breakfast inn that happens to be near these spring waters that have magical healing powers. And uh, not only are the springs known for having magical powers, they're kind of like a portal to other beings and other creatures and other, uh, other, my other mystical uh, encounters. And um, it, it's really, really charming. It, gets in, it, it kind of becomes a little bit of a supernatural E.T. in a way when, uh, the, you know, it's like coming of age in a supernatural sense. But it's so beautiful and so pastoral and it's really, really sweet. And it's called Akko's Inn. All are welcome here. Uh, and then we got a whole bunch from Funimation, so let me uh, hit up some of the uh, Essentials line stuff here. There's a whole bunch in the Essentials line, and I'm going to go through these as quickly as I can. Uh, the Essentials are basically a new line from uh, from Funimation that... Uh, that you know, this is classic anime that uh, has been repriced, and they are uh, making it available for, uh, for collectors uh, all over again. We've got Tokyo ESP, the complete series, part of the Essentials line. These are all Blu-rays and Blu-ray DVD combo sets. Uh, and uh, Tokyo ESP is another high school thing. It's about a you know a girl who's in high school and she works and blah 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 blah. And then something mystical happens when she sees a penguin and flying fish, and it uh, this winds up. Uh, revealing her as kind of a superhero of sorts, and uh, it it's it's a it's you know she's kind of like a psychic superhero, and it's very very odd and very weird. Nicely animated, but a but a terribly peculiar thing. Uh, Selector season one, also from the Essentials line, uh, is uh, is about the uh, card game Wixos. And uh, I don't really understand Wixos, even after watching two episodes of it. It still didn't really uh, get it. But anyway, it's basically kind of like uh, anime Jumanji, in a way. And uh, it's pretty good. It's okay. Um, I think it's, you know, if you, if you really invest in it, which I didn't have time to do, uh, it could probably go somewhere. Soul Eater is also a classic. People have loved Soul Eater for a long time. That is now out. The classic Soul Eater is a complete series. Uh, also, the master of Ragnarok and blesser of Einherjar, E I N H E R J A R, the master of Ragnarok and blesser of Einherjar, the complete series. Uh, also, very very impressively animated. But bottom line, it's really very very much a uh, a Hobbit kind of narrative. Terror in Resonance, the complete series, part of the Essentials line, uh, takes place in a uh, completely destroyed Tokyo under in, in a world where terrorism has just wiped everything out, and uh, you got a uh, you got a couple of you got some pretty devious villains who are who are still carrying out a, uh, a an overall terrorist master plan, and uh, there's kind of a noir story about how they're uh, how they're tracked down, and uh, anyway, it it. It's fine. It's okay. Should have been live action. Uh, Overlord is also popular. That's out in uh, a season three. Selector also has a season two out. And uh, here's one that I thought was really very, very interesting is the uh, One Piece Adventure of Nebulandia TV special. This, is, this goes on kind of a tangent. This is like a spinoff from One Piece. <clears throat> obviously the uh the the pirate thing and um uh it's it it all takes place on this island called Nebulandia which is um uh it, which is kind of an interesting thing it, it they create sort of a hunger games situation on the island and it's uh it's all right it uh, it, it was a nice novel twist a, a nice sidebar to the overall one piece thing if you if you do watch a lot of one piece i don't but mm -hmm. a lot of people do Laughing Under the Clouds, also from the Essentials line, the complete series. Uh, this takes this centers around the uh, shrine of the Kumo brothers and uh, the uh, the ominous return of a uh, a serpent, a serpent monster, and uh, it it it's uh, very mythical. I'm sure that there is something in Japanese mythology that makes sense. If somebody's out there, email us at gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com dot com and explain laughing under the clouds to me 
I'm sure it's part of some Japanese mythology that I don't really understand and don't really know. Very interesting to look at, but kind of kind of weird. Lord Marksman and Vanadis, V-A-N-A-D-I-S, the complete series, also an Essentials line. This is really interesting. Very much a mythical war thing, a fantasy, a fantasy uh, Joseph Campbell heroic journey thing. Um, you know, two warring tribes and uh, and some interesting uh, superpowers in it. Um, but uh, yet different. Um, much more seriously animated. Doesn't really go for um, doesn't go for sort of the the heavy obvious anime action uh, like a lot of the others do. It's very thoughtfully written, and I appreciate that. Lord Marksman and Vanadis. Uh, then there's also Love Tyrant, the complete series. Uh, uh, this is, um, I think it's supposed to be funny, but uh, it didn't really make me laugh. It's uh, it, it's one of these, um, oh, what's the best way to, I guess an anime death becomes her sensibility, nah. right? Death becomes mm. her, it's that kind of humor. Yeah, it's just but it's, it's, yeah, it's mystical, you know, romance and love. I don't know, that that might even not be a very, very good analogy. Um, it, you know, Japanese, anything dealing with Japanese kids very often has a, uh, it deals with dating and, and, and teenage crushes and all that kind of weird stuff. Uh, I don't really know why anime preoccupies itself with that stuff, but it does. Um, if you're a fan of, uh, these are, these are all also really, really famous series. Uh, Dime de Daler, I think is how you pronounce it. Prince versus Penguin Empire, the complete series. I know you're thinking Penguin Empire. Don't try to figure it out. It's it it literally is there is an alien penguin empire and don't worry about it. They're attacking Earth and uh, we we got heroes who'll protect us. Just accept the fact that there is a penguin empire from outer space. That's all you need to know. Uh, that's out and that's actually very very interesting. Helsing Ultimate, the complete collection, volumes one through ten, which is great. This of course goes into this is a uh, a variation on the uh, the Professor Helsing. Of vampire lore, of of uh, Dracula lore, uh, elevated to kind of uh, anime superhero, and uh, with a you know a mythical England, and it's it's cool stuff. If Helsing is is some of the better anime in recent years, uh, Kamisama Kiss season one is uh, back out again. That is also high school fantasy fulfillment, and uh, fans will be thrilled with that. Black Lagoon, the complete collection. Classics, also one that a lot of people are very fond of. And uh, then the last three are um, um, Buddy Complex, the complete series, the Essentials line as well, and Brothers Conflict, the complete series, uh, plus the OVA's Essentials. So all of this stuff uh, from Funimation is, uh, you know, there's a lot here for everybody. It's worth, it's worth, it's worth checking out. Everybody has some... Excuse for all ages and tastes. So mm. it's a good good month for anime. Go for it. Knock yourselves out. Good, 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 good. Uh, shall we do a little bit of the LGBT? Yeah, do it. Stuff? Do we it. only got a few uh, over here to knock off, uh, which I find sort of interesting, uh, actually. The first one is a film called Canary. This is a really, really interesting little movie set, uh, during the apart- set in South Africa during the apartheid era. Uh, this, they had mandatory military service there during that period. This film is about a young man who's forced into his mandatory military service, and he becomes a part of the military choir. Oh, yeah. And they travel all around the country uh, to different army bases and places where soldiers are stationed and very often doing heinous and horrible things to uh, various different folks in the, in the townships. But his band of choir singers, most of whom happen to be gay, as, as this character is, mm-hmm. uh, comes and sits down. They sing these beautiful songs, these chorals, and it's just a, it, it is a completely different juxtaposition to what the rest of the military is doing. What's also interesting is that they can see very clearly uh, the way the apartheid system is working uh, to discriminate against the blacks in South Africa, yet they find themselves still hiding uh, their own sexuality. So they, they, they mm-hmm. have this sort of commiseration with the group based on that sort of kinship there, which it's really an interesting story. Um, so Canary, uh, lovely film. I wish there were more special features on it, but there's only an interview and a couple of promo Aww. and a couple of promo videos there. <laughs> Love Blooms uh, is another neat little story, fairly, fairly straightforward for little story. Uh, about a, about a guy who has this girlfriend who he's deeply in love with, but she already knows that their relationship is over uh, and she's going to break up with him, and she eventually does. Ironically, or interestingly, I should say, he finds himself falling in love again, but this time with a man. 
uh, with a, a, a young filmmaker. He wants to be a filmmaker, and they have a lot in common. And he just sort of finds himself drifting into this relationship. And it's just simply about um, you know how you, you know, uh, things like that can happen every now and again. It's just a perfectly lovely story. And, of course, his girlfriend uh, decides she was wrong and wants him back. <laughs> it's always one of those stories, too. Um, uh, Game Girls. Uh, this is an interesting film. Um, uh, it takes place mostly on Los Angeles Skid Row, right here where we live, and it's about these um, uh, young women uh, who are gay and the time that they have trying to navigate uh, homelessness in Los Angeles as as young gay women. Uh, which uh, homelessness, period, tough thing. Homelessness as a woman, tough thing. Homelessness as a young gay woman on the streets of Los Angeles, you don't even want to know. No. Except that you do, uh, because it's, it's, it's in this very powerful and riveting movie uh, called Game Girls. Uh, and it really, really is a, a, a powerful and moving story uh, about this couple and how they insist on being themselves no matter what the circumstances happen to be. So that's some lovely, lovely films from our... LGBTQ community, and I think I'm going to pop over to uh, new movies. Uh, the new movies, and we have a giveaway. Well, we have a couple of giveaways today. We do. We have, yeah, we got two giveaways. One of them has to do with one of the new movies, and the other one will be tied in later on because we also have an interview, which we will uh, discuss later on. But uh, we'll uh, we'll get through these new movies and the first giveaway first. So let's let's uh, hop to it. Okay. So well, look, I thought this movie was going to do a little bit better than it did. I I, I found it a serviceable film. Best the best of enemies. Raji P. Henson and Sam Rockwell. Yeah, I thought this would be better than it was. Yeah, you know, it's like it was serviceable, but not, yeah. but not particularly good. She's especially, kind of playing that part that she plays, and he's well, having fun. Yeah, but I, I, I'm trying to figure out why this didn't work better because this is this is one of those. You'd think it would have worked at least as well as Green Book. At least as well as Green Book, and and I was also thinking of Cry the Beloved Country. And Cry the, oh yeah, yeah, you know, which has a, yeah. W- w- yeah, which which sort of pushed a lot of the buttons that I think this wants to push, but it for some reason doesn't get there, and I'm not quite sure why. And it's really funny because this one sort of leans into the comedy a little bit, which is sort of you know funny in yeah. and of itself, g- g- given the subject. Uh, 1971, busing is a thing in the United States of America. Uh, th- this uh, black woman finds herself on a community committee uh, opposite a man named C. P. Ellis, a dyed in the wool racist uh, clan. Uh, and Ann Atwater and this man, these are actual historical figures, sort of go at it for a while. But what they find is that they have more things in common than you would think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's he who actually changes over the course of the, the their, their, their acquaintance uh, come friendship, ultimately. Yeah. And much of the movie is about that. I, you know, it was poignant and kind of sweet. I, and I rather liked it, and I wish it had done better. Um, but it didn't. Bonus features, uh, including Making of the Connection, uh, which is a, more or less the Ann Atwater story, and the friendship, uh, the, the unlikely friendship of Ann and CPL. It's a lovely movie in a particular, in a particular kind of way, I thought, anyway. Um, let's see. After. Uh, so this is, this is basically just a little romance about a young woman who's uh, just a, having a perfect little high school life. She goes off to – he has a boyfriend, uh, great in school, her teachers, all that kind of stuff. She goes off to college. Her first semester in college is she meets another guy, a darker, more brooding, uh, sexy kind of guy. And it's about the decision she's going to make for the rest of her life uh, after she meets uh, this new guy in her life. Uh, this is this. I don't know. This is a this is a sort of um, yeah. It, it's just a sort of passionate love story in the vein of maybe endless love or something like that from way back in the day. Um, it's a it's a decent film that I rather enjoyed, and I think other people might like it too. Uh, bonus features include some deleted scenes and uh, one or two other things that folks might find interesting. After cool, uh, folks, Johnny Depp. Uh, for a long time now, I've been talking about Johnny Depp, and I've been thinking about what the hell happened to Johnny Depp. And you know, I mean, he played that pirate four or five times in those big movies, and he mm-hmm. went and he went broke, or he got taken for a bunch of cash or something. I don't know what the hell out, what happened to Johnny Depp, but he he kind of went away for a while. Yeah, he's, he 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 bumps around, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, well, in 2018, Johnny Depp made a film in which Johnny Depp was playing a normal human being, not a pirate, <laughs> not pretending to be Keith Richards or anything like that. It's called The Professor. It it did not register at all. Uh, in in terms of a theatrical uh, release for a film by Johnny Depp, and uh, you know, I mean, and anyway, it's a perfectly again serviceable film. Johnny Depp playing a college professor, sort of in the vein of uh, what was that? Um, uh, uh, Robin Williams film, um, the po- Dead Poet Society. Yep, yep, uh, yep. He, he's a guy who who finds out he has a terminal illness, and he sort of decides to cut loose. 
uh, and uh, Carpe Diem becomes his, his sort of theme, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, there's a he's he's married in, with uh, Rosemary Dewitt. Uh, uh, what's her name? It's not Rosemary Dewitt. I forget her name, what her name is. Um, and uh, and he has he has a couple of students, and he's basically uh, having a Carpe Diem sort of moment as he finds out that he's yeah it is most R- Rosemary Dewitt. He's that he's not going to live long, uh, and everybody thinks he's going crazy, but he hasn't gone crazy. He's just learned uh, that when you know you're going to die, you better start living. And, you know, look, Johnny Depp looks normal in this film. He doesn't have on any costumes. He's just Thank wearing a, a suit and tie and more, more or less acting like a normal person. So uh, if you, if you you know, been wondering where Johnny Depp went, yeah, check, yeah. check him out in that movie. He's, he's, got a, he's got a few performances over the years that just nobody paid attention to him. Yeah, you know, go, oh, uh, uh, what's eating Gilbert Grape? Yeah, uh, that's my probably last uh, really actually yeah. the ninth gate. I really liked him in that in that. Well, I don't think film. I ever saw that. That was that was actually pretty good. The bit bad, bad fox is just absolutely beautiful animation from the uh, from the Academy Award nominated team that gave us Ernest and Celestine a couple of years ago. This is just so sweet and wonderful. A sort of almost Warner Brothers uh, style animation. With all of these really really funny characters uh, who are sort of engaged in these sort of like animals out of um, a water sort of situation, you have a fox who's the mother of a family of chicks. You have a rabbit who wants to be a stork. You have a you have a duck that wants to be Santa Claus, and it's just the sweetest, funniest, most wonderful uh, little film. If simple simple line and in ink, uh, sort of uh, actually uh, more like watercolor animation. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that I really, truly love uh, much more than, I'll say, like Toy Story 4, which is, uh, uh, you know, oh, Toy Story 4 was fine. Didn't do all that well at the box office. Isn't that weird? Uh, I it, thought it might. It's sort of strange. Um, uh, but, you know, people didn't cotton to it as, uh, yeah. in the way that they did to Toy Story 3. Sometimes, I think, because they liked Toy Story 3 so much. Could be. Uh, uh, that was it, all they needed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they could. But, but don't miss this lovely, lovely little animation. Make sure you get it. And by the way, this is not just for kids. This is a beautiful animation for adults. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's great. It's really, beautiful. really sweet stuff. Pet Cemetery, man. Oh, uh, there's our giveaway. Adaptation of the Stephen King from 1989. That first film, 1989, did the junket for that film, Pet Cemetery, back in the day. You know, Here we are 30 years later. With a new one. With a new one. And I tell you what, look, it, 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 this is fine, but it takes itself way too seriously it's a stephen king adaptation <laughs> you know i mean relax people yeah. you know anyway the, the native american cemetery you bury yeah. something there it comes back but don't come back, back exactly the same usually yeah. comes back one to try to kill you and eat you um this uh 4k uh blu-ray has an alternate ending seven deleted scenes and 90 minutes of bonus material so it is a hell of a thing uh for our giveaway right yep and we are giving away Two copies, two regular 4Ks, but we're also giving away, <clears throat> excuse me, a grand prize. So here's what we get. It's gonna all going to be randomly chosen. Send us an email to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com, either one. And make sure it gets to us by December 21st. If it's December, December 22nd, not, or sorry, December, July, <laughs> yeah, yeah. July 21st, July 21st, not July 22nd, July 21st. And put uh, put pet p e t in the subject line. Put your name and address in the body of the email, and we will choose three very lucky people. Two of you will get regular four Ks of the new Pet Cemetery. One of you will get the grand prize, which includes a four K signed by the director plus a sweatshirt. How's that, Paramount? Mm-hmm. Paramount is looking out for you people. That's what I'm talking about. So that's that's fun stuff. So uh, you will get a uh, if you if you're the grand prize winner, you will get a uh, 4K signed uh, by the uh, by the director and a sweatshirt, and then uh, two other people will just get regular 4Ks. So go ahead and send us uh, an email to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. And uh, put pet in the subject line, name and address in the body of the email. Make sure it gets to us by July 21st. No later, July 21st. And uh, we do love it when Paramount does that. And we also have another Paramount giveaway that we'll talk about later when the interview comes around. Mm. All right. Thank what you else? A couple, of, a couple of more uh, under new movies. I, again, uh, this one uh, really surprised me that it didn't do a little bit better, particularly given the the, the source of the uh, the, the, uh, the story. Hotel Mumbai, 
Uh, yeah, it, I expected this to do better too. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, for one thing, it's a, f- it's a fairly thrilling movie about a, about true events. The 2008 yeah. uh, uh, terrorist attack on uh, the Taj Hotel in Mumbai, in India. I, th- I remember that like it was yesterday. I was uh, riveted. I was well. It, it went on for several hours, for yeah. one thing, and it, it, was, it was covered live. Um, it was uh, yeah, yeah, harrowing events. Uh, and out of that came a number of stories, particularly those regarding some of the staff of the hotel, uh, including the, uh, the, the the very important chef of the hotel and and a few of the a few of the waiters, one played by Deb Patel in this movie, who uh, put themselves in harm's way to sort of protect us. Uh, in some cases, actually save. In some cases, they actually sacrificed themselves uh, for some of their guests uh, and some of the other things that went on um, uh, during this extremely harrowing period. Anyway, um, it, it was, it's, it's a powerful and riveting story about, a, about true events uh, that I thought was fairly captivating. Um, uh, uh, bonus features here include Finding the Story, um, uh, uh, a, little, a v- little video documentary, The Real Life Heroes, which actually talks about several of those people, um, uh, you know, natives there at the hotel who put their, themselves in jeopardy. Uh, for their guests, including some of the characters played by the uh, by the actors here, um, and so you know, uh, I, I, I thought it was a pretty good movie, and uh, I wish it would have done a little bit better. Af- the aftermath, uh, again, um, a film that I thought might have done a little bit better, a post World War II drama uh, with Kira Knightley and Jason Clark, uh, Ned Willis in the film. Um, it, so it's set during this this period in Hamburg after the city had been more or less destroyed by the bombs. Uh, yeah. By the by the bombs, and and we have this this colonel who's assigned to the city to sort of rebuild things. He's he's uh, billeted in this uh, rather prestigious home, and for whatever reason, he allows the the the, the, the home's owner, once the home's owner, played by Stellan Skarsgård. And, and his daughter to stay in the home with him and his wife, Kira Knightley. All kinds of enmity is at play here to do with what happened during the war and uh, grief. Uh, uh, it's a really, really interesting and, and, and powerful story that didn't do very well. Again, but I got to tell you, this is a fairly charged and interesting and complicated drama. Uh, that I that I nevertheless recommend. Some of these movies, I think, perhaps don't do as well as they might. Simply because people are, are are waiting to see, particularly the dramas, yeah, in the, on the streaming services, and, and you know, I, I suppose it's okay. So uh, for, for some, but I got to tell you, this is a gorgeous movie to watch, and it really looked great on the big screen. I happen to see it on the big screen. Nevertheless, here for the Blu-ray, we have deleted scenes and uh, audio commentary from the director James Kent, and uh, and a few other bits and pieces of delightful uh, special features. And then lastly, we have this movie called Beach Bum. Oh dear! Uh, this, this, they tried this, to make this, this for so many years. Oh, no, this nutty Harmony Corinne film, it's Harmony Corinne, obsa- Julian Dunkey, an boring. obsession of Matthew McConaughey's and, to get this yeah. movie made. And uh, so you know, and he finally does. And you, 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 no. interesting, they got Harmony Harmony Corinne. It's yeah. just a pothead movie, more more of an acid trip movie to be specific. Uh, anyway, Snoop Dogg and Matthew McConaughey and Ella Fisher and do this goofy movie about this sort of rebellious stoner guy named Moon Dog. Uh, come on, Matt. Uh, who'd you grow up watching with long hair? And, and I don't know if people know this about Matt McConaughey, but Matt McConaughey is more or less this guy. Yeah, <laughs> in, he is in real life. He's no, he is. He absolutely is. Beach bum kind of guy who pulled off a hell of an and, acting career. And and I should point out too, just just so that everybody understands what's going on here. So this character that Matthew McConaughey plays. Um, uh, being as I live in the same city as Matthew McConaughey, yeah, and, and uh, I grew up with people like this, like when uh, okay, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit and do a little tangent with Sean Penn's character Spicoli mm-hmm. in the, in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Mm-hmm. Sean Penn is three years older than I am. Okay, so Sean Penn, you know, and I knew Chris in school. Mm-hmm. Sean and, and and I, and obviously Chris and Charlie and everybody else who went to school at that Chris time. Chris Penn and, and Charlie all, Sheen and all those guys all went to school with these brothers from one family who all are that character, ah, that Spicoli character, yeah. literally that guy. The youngest of them was actually like Spicoli crossed with Animal on the Muppets. Ah. Okay? <laughs> like he'd walk up and down the halls going, ah, 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 banging his head on railings and, you know, oh. scaring the girls. Okay, so those are characters that really exist. Matthew McConaughey's character here really is who he is mm. in life. And you remember when he was uh, he was accosted by paparazzi yeah. on the beach? Yeah. And two guys came after them and assaulted the paparazzi and broke their cameras and threw them in the ocean <gasps> and had assault charges filed against them? One of those guys has been on our city council for six years. <laughs> I'm just, just pointing that out. 
Oh. Actually, for eight years. It'll be oh. eight years at oh. the end of this year. So, yeah, he's termed out. Oh. But this is uh, yeah, so, what is, you know, so small lo- town. Loosely based on the true stories. Oh, like, my oh, goodness town. gracious. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got an interview and two more giveaways, actually. Uh, <laughs> but a big giveaway that goes with the interview. We're going to get to that right at the uh, end of the show. But we've got foreign right now. Mm-hmm. we got a lot of really cool foreign stuff. And uh, I'm going to start off and mention a couple from uh, the uh, th- a couple of really really interesting foreign language films, uh, both of them from the uh, the good people at uh, Big World Pictures. And the first one is something that I like very very much, and that's very very close to my heart. It's called uh, In the Last Days of the City. This is. Um, this is an Egyptian film by Tamer El, S- El Said, and uh, it played theatrically here in Los Angeles, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And it is um, really an incredibly powerful film. The stuff that's coming out of the Arab world lately is is quite extraordinary, and uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful poetic film that it basically looks at the um, at all of the changes that are, that take place in Cairo. Uh, right around the time of the fall of the Mubarak regime. Yeah. And it's just, uh, you know, it's all through the eyes of an actual filmmaker who's trying to capture this moment in time. And uh, it, it, it's really very unusual, and it's a very textured thing, and it's just, it's poetic, and it's lyrical, and it's an absolutely beautiful movie. And uh, I really highly recommend it. It's called In the Last Days of the City, uh, out on DVD. The other one is uh, from director Julia Murat. It's a Brazilian, Argentinian, and French co-production. It is in Portuguese, so it's primarily a Brazilian film with Argentinian and French money in it. This has played a whole bunch of festivals. It's called Pendular. It was also at the AFI Fest in Los Angeles, so a lot of people here saw it at the time. And um, Julia Murat is uh, a second-time filmmaker, and uh, this is this uh, focuses on the experiences of this young couple who um, who uh, move into a basically a loft, and they're uh, they oh boy how do I even not give this away? Um, there are uh, the loft has an interesting geography. That's the only way I'm going to put this. The art has an interesting geography, and um, it the geography defines their relationship, their work. Uh, how they relate to the world, and uh, it's it's it all it is also very poetic and very unusual and very very interesting, and um, it's worth checking out. Uh, the movie is Pendular, P E N D U L A R, and it is a it's really it's just lovely and intimate. Uh, and then I'm going to mention this and then turn it over to Tim for some uh, other stuff. We got uh, this is our uh, our second giveaway of the day, Fury F U R I E. Uh, this is a terrific, terrific, powerful film from uh, Wellgo. They have given us four copies for giveaway. So uh, go ahead and send us an email if you want one of the four to gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com. Has to get to us by July 21st. Put Fury, F U R I E, in the uh, subject line, body uh, name and address in the body of the email. This is, uh, this is just a really, really sensational action uh, movie. Um, about a girl who is uh, kidnapped by a sex trafficking ring, and uh, her mother, who, who it, it turns out to be the mom you don't want to cross. Uh, she uh, mom mom used to be mom used to be an outlaw, and uh, mom knows how to wreak vengeance and bring her daughter home. If it sounds a little bit like Taken, that's exactly what it is. It is uh, it is a female version of Taken, and. Um, it stars Veronica Enjo from Star Wars The Last Jedi, and she is fierce, and she is going to save her daughter, and man, is this a whole lot of fun female just bone-busting action. It mm. is really great. The movie is Fury, F-U-R-I-E, giving away four of those. Gods at digigods.com, gods at cinegods.com, put F-U-R-I-E in the subject line. Sweet. Um, uh, a couple here, uh, also foreign language. This one um, uh, is, is just a beautiful story. Uh, Un Traductor um, is, is based on a loosely true story uh, about this doctor. It's set during the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. 
Uh, and during that period, when uh, the Soviet Union and, of course, Cuba were, were still staunch allies, many of the children who experienced uh, radiation uh, exposure during that um, uh, disaster were sent to Cuba because Cuba had better hospitals. Yep. The one thing the Cubans actually uh, still do have are uh, lots and lots of re- well-trained doctors. Uh, this stars uh, Rodrigo Santuro as a uh, uh, one of the doctors who receives uh, these children from Chernobyl during this period, uh, and he becomes engaged in taking care of these Chernobyl children to the detriment of his own family and his own life. Uh, and, uh, right during this period, of course, the Berlin, Berlin Wall falls. Yeah. And of course, when the Berlin Wall falls, then the Soviet Union uh, does not be, is, is not a very good sponsor for Cuba anymore. <laughs> all of right. the, all the, so all of that is going on during this film uh, as we look, as it's set against the backdrop of, uh, of Chernobyl and everything. It's just a really, really powerful movie. I love Rodrigo Santuro. Yeah, uh, great. a Brazilian actor, yeah. uh, actually, but but really, really wonderful. Um, uh, 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 thoroughly dug him in this movie, and it's a, a powerful and really neat movie, too. Um, let's see here. Let me do one. I got one. Yeah. I got another one here. Three Faces by Jafar Panahi. If you haven't followed the Odyssey, Jafar Panahi, at the time of the Green Revolution, um, supported the wrong people, well, the right people, in Iran and was banned from filmmaking uh, by the Iranian government. And, of course, naturally, being Jafar Panahi, he responded to his ban uh, from filmmaking by making movies. He continued to make movies either under, even under house arrest. He even went into – he did taxi, but driving around the city. He, he made a movie – to, uh, about his uh, fight with the authorities and talking to his lawyers, he just he the man will not be constrained. Jafar Panahi is one is is the conscience of Iran, and uh, he is officially no longer under house arrest. Uh, he's not really supposed to be making movies anymore either at this point. But he decided to make Three Faces, and it is the it is the best film he's made in years. It's a real movie. It's not shot with a digital camera underground and or on the fly. It is. It's with actors and a script and the whole thing. And yeah. the weird thing is, he plays himself in it. Yeah. And it is. Uh, <clears throat> it is a really, really interesting meta film. It's. Uh, it's truly, truly fascinating. And it's. Uh, it's very much like a cross between what he's been doing during his punishment period, and what he was doing before that. And um, it's. Uh, boy, this is hard to not divulge it because. There, this centers around. There's a mystery here. There's a mystery about um, uh, that centers on some cell phone video and whether what is shown on the cell phone video is true or not. There's a question about this, and I won't tell you what the video shows. You learn very early watching this what what's going on, but I'm going to leave it to everybody's imagination right now. What the cell phone shows may or may not be true, and that of course is an interesting allegory for everything that's going on in Iran in his movies. He wants you to question the truth, question what you're being told. Don't believe everything that's shown to you. There's a real, there's a real message to this. And um, and uh, Panahi and one of and uh, one of his longtime uh, associates, this this woman who also plays herself, they undertake to unravel the mystery. And um, it's fascinating. You have no idea where this thing goes. It takes you into corners of Iranian uh, rural society that that most people have never even seen before, have never would would have no idea even existed, and it's a really really interesting film and it's beautifully made. This is from Kino, and it features a booklet interview with uh, Jafar Panahi and uh, some trailers, and it is on Blu-ray and you got to check it out. It was also at the Toronto Film Festival. It's a wonderful wonderful movie, Three Faces, um, and. Um, the other, the next film here is an old John Woo film that most people have probably never seen. This is from Film Movement Classics. It's on Blu-ray. Heroes Shed No Tears. Um, this is from uh, 1986. Oh. For some crazy reason, I thought this was earlier. I thought this was uh, like 81 or something, but uh, there goes my memory. Anyway, uh, 1986 John Woo movie, when John Woo is sort of starting to become John Woo. And um, this is right before he made A Better Tomorrow. So you, you really see it all kind of coming together. You know, John Woo started making just work like martial arts movies and stuff that you would never associate with John Woo, where he's just a hired hand. This is where you begin to actually see him develop his style, develop his sensibilities. He's coming out of his, he's coming out of his corner, and he's, and he's doing a, a remarkable job. And A Better Tomorrow is usually regarded as the film that sort of started the whole yeah. thing. Anyway, this is right on the eve of that. 
and uh, it's a it's a war film. It's a it's a commando. You know, it's a it's a commando mission movie. Maybe his version of uh, Delta Force or something like that. Um, all of them, you know, their their mission is to capture a drug lord out of the Golden Triangle, and you know, it's it's a kind of predictable genre thing, but it's the style, you know. Uh, it's the it's the way that he treats the jungle, the way he choreographs the scenes. You really really feel like this is this guy is something different, this is something new, and it's a terrific film. It's a beautiful Blu-ray transfer. They really really did a very very good job here. They uh, worked with Fortune Star on this, got some really good elements, and uh, gave us a great transfer. And you get an essay by Grady Hendrix and an interview with uh, Eddie Coe, who is the star of the film. It's Heroes Shed No Tears from uh, Film Movement Classics on Blu-ray. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff, man. Uh, a couple of really lovely ones here. Um, uh, this film, uh, No Date, No Signature, a uh, very powerful Iranian film uh, by Vihad Javavalan. That's the way you say his name, I think. So this movie follows uh, a, a doctor. He's actually a pathologist. He has a car accident where he hits this little boy. He wants to take the little boy to the clinic, to the hospital. He offers the father money. The father doesn't take the money. The father refuses all of this. This has to do with class in the context of what's going on in this scene. He finds out later that the little boy, who is, in fact, taken to the hospital, dies. Uh, because he is a pathologist, he's able to take a look at the coroner's report for the little boy, and, 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 and it doesn't add up for him. He feels like something else is going on. Of course, he's guilty uh, because he hit the b little boy with his car in the first place. Uh, it, it, it's just a wonderful story that exposes all sorts of uh, issues around class within uh, the Iran that we probably don't know about uh, here as we think about the things that are going on between the United States and that country. But it's really, really a very seductive movie. Uh, that this really just goes into that very specific point about class distinctions in a country that we know very little about, but it's, a, it's actually one hell of a thing. Uh, Becoming Astrid. Oh, I like this movie a it, lot. It really, it really is wonderful. You want to do yeah. this one? No, no, no. Go ahead. Hit it off. It's, uh, it's, it's a fun movie. It's really sweet. Astrid, of course, being the one who created Pippi Longstreet. Yeah, Pippi Longstreet. So, and, and a number of children's novels. Yeah. And this is, this, this is simply the story of her life, how she came. More or less, she was Pippi Longstreet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but for a bit of a, a imagination. Yeah. So she sort of wrapped uh, herself into those stories that she told, told her. It's a really beautifully done and, uh, film that I, that I thoroughly enjoy. Beautiful to look at, too, this film, Becoming Astrid. Uh, by Alba August, Becoming Astrid, the, the Pippi Longstocking story, really great. This uh, movie here, the second time around, I loved for a couple of different reasons. Uh, uh, the reason that I loved it most is because Linda Thorson stars in it. It's about an no, older woman who's in a convalescent home, uh, and she, she runs into this man while she's convalescing after she's broken her hip, played by Stuart Margolin. Uh, and they start to fall in love, and it's about how that relationship develops later in life. Now, those of you who are like me and Wade know that Linda Thorson yeah. replaced Diana Rigg as the, uh, yeah. the, 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 on the, the, Avengers. the spy on the Avengers. So it was, mm -hmm. it was Kathy Gale. Yeah, uh, who who then be uh, Diana Rigg? Yeah, and then uh, Linda Thorson, and, and who played Tara King. Yeah, and and, and uh, uh, Honor Blackman, and Honor. Oh, Honor Blackman, Honor Blackman played, played, yeah, played, played Kathy Gale. Kathy, Honor, played Honor Kathy Gale. played Kathy. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, um, uh, Diana Rigg played Emma Peel. Right, Linda played Tara King, and then in the New Avengers. Uh, oh yes, uh, um, um, from yeah, uh, it, from Abfab. Abfab, yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so Linda Thorson, I was, I you know, look. After experiencing uh, Joanna uh, Lumley, uh, Joanna Lumley, yeah. yeah. After experiencing Diana Rigg as Emma Peel, I thought I was done. Yeah. And then she came into that show, so and I, great. And I got to tell you, I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to stick around. I'm with you. It's yeah. like it's like when Cheryl Ladd came on and replaced yeah. Farrah. I was like, oh, you know yeah. what? I'm going to stick around. Yeah. Uh, Madik Ali. Uh, starring Selma Hyatt, uh, directed by Jorge Fon. So this is an adaptation of an Edward Marfuz yeah. uh, novel, uh, a, a, a Nobel laureate, uh, that was set in Cairo. He did an entire series of those novels. They were called the Cairo Stories, and they're wonderful, wonderful. They translate, transfer the story to uh, to Mexico, to Mexico City. And what we're doing is we're looking at a number of different characters as they overlap a, a little bit. Uh, we have the the owner of a pub uh, and what's going on in his cantina. Uh, we have a man uh, who's married and has a son who who sort of gives into latent uh, homosexual feelings. Uh, we have Samuel Hyde's character uh, and 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 all that she's doing. It's really really just this beautiful humanistic movie. I read all those Cairo story now. Edward, I think Edward lived to be like ninety ninety nine years old. He only died a couple of years. Edward Mafuz, mm -hmm. uh, and those just one. And by it's really interesting though that they transferred all of that. 
uh, to Mexico City. And yeah. it still works. It still works. Fascinating. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Got a couple of German films here. Uh, one is actually a German-Mongolian co-production. How often do you hear about that? Yeah. This is from IndiePix, uh, IndiePix Unlimited line, which you can also see on Prime Video channels on uh, on Amazon Prime. Uh, and uh, this thing uh, was at the Munich Film Festival in 2015. And it is, uh, they call it a German-Mongolian love drama. I don't, it's, I, it's just a weird thing to say. But in any <laughs> case, it, the movie is called Don't Look at Me That Way. And it is very Fassbinderian mm -hmm. or Fassbinder-esque. Uh, I think Fassbinder would love something like this. Um, basically, you have a couple of women uh, live next to each other who wind up having a relationship. And one of them has a daughter and uh, the and one of them has a father who enters the equation at a certain point and makes it get all real complicated and weird. And this is really all this is about, is that you're taking some, some very damaged and interesting and curious characters with baggage, and you're dropping them into this pressure cooker of a situation in these adjacent apartments, and uh, you're just letting the, uh, the, uh, the, the chemistry happen. And it explores all kinds of really, really... Interesting issues and in a very very tight uh, little bear not even not even an hour and a half I don't think it goes really quickly it's a very interesting movie um, very unusual movie don't look at me that way it's really worth checking out and then the other one is called Sticks uh, named after the famous uh, mythical river this is by the director Wolfgang Fischer and it has a terrific lead performance in it from uh, Suzanne Wolf with two Fs, who won an award for this at the German Film Awards. Um, essentially, it's about a woman who uh, decides to go to Ascension Island uh, all by herself on a boat, just do a little solo boat trip to Ascension Island. And along the way, she comes across uh, some refugees uh, who are, they're, they're, you know, their ship is endangered. And um, that then obviously precipitates uh, a whole litany of really, really interesting character engagements that... Um, uh, that change how she and the refugees see each other, see the world, uh, see reality. It's, it, it becomes a very challenging encounter, a surprise encounter at sea that just challenges everything. It's very interesting. It's not un the fact that it's named Styx is an intentional reference to the mythical river, uh, and uh, it's, it's a really well-done film. Wolfgang Fischer can probably write his, uh, his Hollywood ticket with this. It's that well-directed. It's a very, very sharp film. Sticks. Interesting stuff, man. And Afghan love story. This is a this is a powerful and, and, and moving film. Although, you know, I, I should warn you, tragic because you know it's an Afghan love yeah. story. Uh, and so it, it's set in Cabal. Uh, a guy named Mustafa. He's this waiter. Uh, it, it runs into this beautiful young female law student. Charms her. They start a relationship. They're very mindful of you know all of the sort of societal rules about that. In any case, she gets pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, she tells him. He does not support her, does not consent to marriage. And basically the rest of the movie is about what she faces uh, in, in the context of these uh, circumstances. A pregnant woman uh, in Kabul, Afghanistan. It doesn't go well, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a powerful and deeply moving film. Um, uh, it, look, the film, the, 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 the film is all about the strength of these women, and uh, it's, it, it's astounding from that context, but it's really, uh, you know, really disturbing as well. Agony. Uh, and in the, so in this film, uh, we and this is a little this is kind of disturbing too for a whole bunch of reasons. But stick with it if you can because it's about machoism uh, and toxic masculinity, which is the thing that we're talking about yeah. in society right now. So a young woman is murdered, her body is dismembered and dumped all over Vienna. Uh, to the police, fairly quickly, two young men become prime suspects. Either one of them could have done it, although neither one of them have particular motives to have done it. They don't overlap, these two, these two suspects of, of, of this murder. Uh, they have completely dis disparate lives. Uh, they're very different men, but both of them, in their own way, were perfectly capable of committing this murder. Uh, and over the arc of this movie, uh, we find out that one of them Definitely did. You got another one over there? Yes, I do. This is a great, great movie. This is really, really uh, highly, highly recommended. Uh, this is on Blu-ray. It is called Transit, and this is from director Christian Petzold, who previously did uh, Phoenix and Barbara, which uh, was Oscar-nominated. Um, and uh, Petzold is one of the best filmmakers in the world. 
he has he just is he's he's going to continue to have a phenomenal career. It's just going to be up and up and up and up for him. The best thing about that, this was uh, described by IndieWire, and they even put it on the on the packaging too as uh, Casablanca as written by Kafka, and that's the best description I can possibly give you. Um, it's based on a 1944 novel by the novelist Anna Seegers, and uh, it is all um, it it's about a guy who. Um, when uh, he, well, how, how do you even explain this uh, this amazing odyssey of his? It's a it's an it's a swapped identity thing. So uh, the Nazis are are getting ready to invade Paris, and uh, Georg is uh, decides that he's going to just escape to uh, Marseille, and there he takes on a new identity and uh, decides that he's going to come to America, where he. Um, where the new identity becomes even more convoluted than he possibly could have imagined, and that leads into another mystery nested inside the mystery, and there's a missing person, and it just it, it really it really does create this Kafka esque labyrinth of mystery and uh, and um, um, identity. You know the question of who are you and and can you become someone else and uh, can you get lost in a new society in a new culture, and uh, all against the backdrop of war. There's so much going on. I'm totally short uh, short changing it. You, it. It's just it's a it's a really really interesting movie. It's called Transit. Uh, has some great performances in it. Franz uh, Rogowski, Paula Beer. Really tremendous cast and some very, very cool extras on here on the making of the film, an interview with uh, Christian Petzold, um, uh, some other featurettes and Q&A. It's a good film. Really check it out. Transit. Worth, uh, worth, uh, worth buying, I would yeah. say. Get this on Blu-ray. Uh, a couple of more. Uh, yeah. School of Life. This is a lovely film directed by uh, Nicolas de Venner. It's a French film. It's about, uh, it's about a man who grew up in an orphanage uh, in suburban Paris. His whole entire life he spent uh, in, you know, in the sort of city suburbs of Paris. He meets this couple uh, who run a sort of a game preserve out in the countryside, and, uh, and they coax him into coming out to the country with them. And it's about how his life, his perspective, his understanding of things changes when he actually goes out into the countryside and starts uh, uh, living uh, among among the folks out there. It actually involves this poacher that he meets uh, who's like the nemesis of the guy who he's staying. There's a whole little thriller thing that goes on there. But mostly... It's simply about the way <coughs> being in nature in the countryside affects and changes this man who had only ever known the city. It's a lovely, lovely film, uh, particularly beautiful because it's uh, the cinematographer, Eric Gouchard, uh, uh, shot Bell and Sebastian, that beautiful movie, Bell and Sebastian. So, you know, uh, and this movie is really about the beauty of the countryside. Uh, lastly, over here, I've got, uh, I've got this little, again, wonderful little film. Uh, director's Milad Alami. It's called The Charmer. It's this beautiful little movie. Uh, a young Iranian man is living is living in Denmark. He wants to get married uh, uh, to, to a citizen so he can stay in Denmark. He's a good-looking guy. He puts on a suit. He goes out every night. And he tries to meet these women. And uh, he has all these one-night stands and terrible uh, circumstances. And then finally he meets a woman with whom he has everything in common. But, of course, she too is Iranian. And marrying her won't be uh -huh. any good. Uh, but she's the one he's in love with. Whatever will he do? It's a lovely and sweet film. I really, really found it quite charming. Uh, and uh, I think you should check it out. Uh, Mojin, The Worm Valley. This is a sequel to Mojin, The Lost Legend, which was kind of like a martial artsy, you know, Indiana Jones thing. Uh, this, this is from Huayi Brothers in, uh, in China. And uh, the sequel... We are back uh, in the company of the legendary Indiana Jones. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, Hubai Yi, basically a Chinese uh. Indiana Jones with a sword instead of a whip. And uh, he's looking for the tomb of the Emperor Xi'an. And, of course, the Emperor Xi'an's tomb is on an island with a whole lot of monsters and giant monstrosities yeah. and horrible things. You know, yeah. it's a monster movie. It's basically an Indiana Jones monster movie. It's a lot of fun, actually. Mojin, the Worm Valley. And then uh, the last two that we have here is the very fine Dog Man, Matteo Garoni's film, not on Blu-ray. This is on DVD. Don't know why they did that. Garone, who of course did the famous Gamora, mm -hmm. uh, is a is I a very is a terrific stylist. And uh, Dog Man is a is an unusual movie. It's not uh, it's not uh, it's it's very different from what he's done before. It takes place uh, in this little village. 
and uh, there appear to be no real... It's a very unusual village, let's just put it that way. And um, they, it, it centers around this guy, this very nebbishy guy, who uh, works at a dog grooming salon, and uh, the winds up being sort of lured into a, uh, a delinquent activity, let's just say a, an unusual scheme, um, by this local thug. And um, the where this scheme goes, you would never guess in a million years. You just you don't see. You, you, honestly, you have no idea where this story is leading. You just sort of buy into the fact this is an unusual guy, unusual town. He grooms dogs, and then it takes a left turn, and you don't know whether to cry or laugh or scream. Um. It really is an unusual movie. It was. I. I, I just thought it was fantastic. Um, you know, he, he, that little guy and that and that sociopath asshole. Yeah, the, uh, the one know, that hires him. The hires him. Yeah. You know, and then he, he forces him to do that thing. You know, and man, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It's weird, right? Yeah, yeah. It's weird, but it's good. Yeah. Like good, weird in a good way. Yeah, yeah. And then we're going to talk about weird in a bad way. So, uh, well, Tim will disagree with me on this, but <laughs> we're we're going to go out fr- with the ridiculous, which is Jean-Luc Godard, always oh, a great way to go out, uh, with his film Detective, with a great cast, Claude Brasseur, Natalie Bai, Johnny Halliday. It's a great cast. Yeah. Uh, but and it's, uh, a, and it's a coherent Godard film. It actually has a narrative. Well, this is right right about when he was ready to throw in the towel on narrative in yeah. 1985. This is right. I think he cracked about 1987. <laughs> I think he lost his mind. Uh, uh, but it, you know, essentially, this feels like. I mean, this is a little bit of a. It's a little bit of a melodrama. It feels like it feels like it's a little bit of Truffaut, a little bit of. Of everybody that he knew, mm-hmm. right? He's like he's trying. He's sort of trying to step on everybody's genres, saying, "I can do this better than you. Yeah. I can do this better than you. I can do this better than you." And uh, you know, it, it's a it's a little bit unusual. But um, anyway, Jean Pierre Leo and Laurent Tezieff play a couple of uh, detectives who are trying to figure out the case of an assassination. And then there's this uh, this boxer played by Johnny Halliday who's staying in the same uh, hotel and uh, trying to, well, he, you know, he's trying to, he's got a, a young protege that he's bringing up and he's trying to, you know, prepare him. And uh, then there's this, all this other noir stuff that links it all up. And there's all, it, it's almost like a farce that's not funny. It's like a tragic farce, yeah. if that makes sense. And it's very American because, you know, the thing that we always say about the new wave directors is how much yeah. they were influenced. But this is like a ridiculously American film. It, it sort of is. And, uh, you, like, you, you know, know what? It's like a Vim Vendors movie, yeah. Yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's like a Vim Vendors you know, movie. Sort of, well. sort of floats off a little bit. Yeah, well, there it is. <laughs> so so here's where we're going out. So uh, a very, very good friend of mine just wrote a book, an amazing book. He was on CBS this morning uh, riding roller coasters touting his book last week. Mm. Uh, and uh, he's he's been all over the place. He's he's been in, in every city in the country touting this thing. Stephen Silverman is a tremendous author. Stephen's written a lot of great books. He wrote the uh, Stanley Donnan biography. He wrote the original David Lean biography, coffee table book. And uh, he's he's been a you know a journalist, newspaper guy forever. He's originally from California, lives and works in New York, and he has a new book called The Amusement Park. This is an epic book. This is an amazing book. And it is literally the story, the history of amusement parks and theme parks going back into like three, four hundred years and the origins of roller coasters. And then he gets into Coney Island and the prostitutes and the, he calls them the schemers and dreamers. It's all about the schemers and dreamers who build amusement parks and obviously leading up to Walt Disney, who mm. reinvented the concept for our day. And it's just it's a tremendous book. There are so many great stories in it. It is a wonderful book, The Amusement Park. And I had a chance to talk to Stephen uh, in the middle of his very, very busy, crazy uh, press tour and talk to him about this book. And here's what we're going to do to help promote this book. Mm. Um, we have a giveaway, again, courtesy of uh, Paramount. And we reviewed it a few weeks ago. It's the book Wonder Park. And uh, Paramount agreed to give away three Blu-rays of Wonder Park in, in, uh, along with our promotion of the, uh, the amusement park. And uh, you can go ahead and send us an email at gods at digigods.com or gods at cinegods.com with park, P A R K, in the subject line, name and address in the body. And uh, by July 21st, we will choose three very lucky people to get a Blu ray of Wonder Park. Mm. And without further ado, here is my interview with Stephen Silverman, author of The Amusement Park. Uh, the, one of the 
great joys of this job is being able to interview people that I actually know and admire. And in this case, uh, I can I can double that um, because Stephen Silverman is simply uh, someone I, I am proud to know, and I am I so respect his writing. I'm so proud to call you a friend. And Stephen, let me let me just preface this by explaining to people that. You've written two of the great showbiz books of all time, Biography of Stanley Donnan and the original David Lean biography slash coffee table book that, that uh, I fell in love with and thumbed through when I was much younger uh, on, a, on such a daily basis that I had to buy another one to keep it pristine. And that's a true I story. I too. <laughs> well, Stephen, has, you, you have a new book out. Uh, which I dare say really outdoes everything else you've ever done. It's the amusement park, 900 years of thrills and spills and the dreamers and schemers who built them. Uh, This is an astonishing book, and uh, what I think people may not realize is there has never been a resource before on the history of amusement parks. You have created the first and to date the only serious reference book on this history, you said you did this, it, it, you wrote it and researched it in seven and a half months. Could you talk about how you executed such a superhuman feat? There is so much information here. It just proves I have no life. <laughs> well, not true if you were going to all these amusement parks. You know, it is true. I mean, I knew nothing about Bartholomew Fair, and that is where I started. And granted, there were certain areas I did know about. To be honest, when I got to Disneyland, I practically, I, I almost had to, I did, I had to go back and insert source notes so the book would be, uh, you know, continuous and, and, and match the rest of the book. Because all that, I grew up with that. I knew it. Um, but the rest I did have to piece together. But it, it was the most enjoyable jigsaw puzzle I ever, well, I created it, then put together you know the, the only fault i just sat down I, i'm a serial writer i sat down and i wrote now mind you these days so many of the great libraries from the british museum to stanford university to harvard yale and princeton their libraries are online and that wow. makes such a tremendous difference and i knew what i was looking for when i didn't again you know it was a wonderful puzzle and i would spring out of bed in the morning and I couldn't wait to write. I, you know, I would reread what I had written the day before, clean that up, and then forge ahead. And the shape of the book really took place as I wrote it, as, and then I would break to walk the dog, and as we would sit in the park or play in the park, my mind was back on the book and thinking, well, this chapter will really play better if I move it here. And that, you know... That's how it is. I'm an old newspaper man, uh, and even quicker than a newspaper, which was a daily deadline. Wow. I, you know, I, I worked at the New York Post when yeah. I was in my 20s. Well, see, it's discipline. And, discipline is what and, does it. Yeah, and then there was, you know, work, I started People Magazine's website. Well, that was fine <laughs> at the beginning because it was really that, too, was a daily deadline. But as the Internet progressed and everything moved online, you, you know, you had minute-by-minute minute deadlines. You know, I'll, I'll never forget the phone call. Michael Jackson died. Start writing. Well, this was like one, yeah. like in, in an extreme moment like that, except I enjoyed it no end. Uh, I even uh, I turned in the manuscript a week early, a week before deadline. Wow. That is... Yeah, I can't explain it. When it works, it works. My David Lean book, that wrote itself. David was – it, it was a pleasure to write. And when you, – your subject is a pleasure, it moves brilliantly. Stanley Donnan was a difficult character. I can say that now. And that book took four and a half years. And it, it just so – anything can happen. But this one, I just loved it. You, you have both inspired and guilted me at the same time. I'm going uh, to try to be more productive with my time now. <laughs> I feel so – well, you, <laughs> I feel so deficient. Um, you have a personal life. I do too. <laughs> well, but you, you know, it's it's what what I find so incredible about this is number one, realizing how old the history of amusement parks is. Talk about how the idea came to you, how this originated, 
and and talk about the origins of of uh, theme park rides. Really, how far back that goes. Well, my my own interest is, is that what you want to know? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I've always liked them. <laughs> I mean, I was a kid. I grew up in Southern California, and uh, even I I remember when the Sunday night television show came on and Walt Disney was previewing this place he said he was building. And I, I know I must have bugged my parents to take me there because my father did. I, rem- I still remember getting sick. Uh, and I, I still get car sick. I'm uh, sick on the Santa Ana freeway. But we went and I cried because I didn't see Donald Duck. Um, oh. but, I grew up, but it was always, you know, who didn't want to go to Disney? What kid didn't want to go to Disneyland? And I never outgrew that. And there were wonderful, there were merry-go-rounds all over Southern California, not just Beverly Park. But there was one near my aunt and uncle's in Westchester, actually near, I, I, I would swear, I, I never looked it up again, uh, near Hillside Cemetery, where my family is. Um, but there was a merry-go-round there that, with a small roller coaster. There were roller coasters on piers. I, it turns out those sort of shut down in the 30s. <laughs> I, I seem to have them in my mind. I'm not that old. Uh, I'm a baby boomer. And, uh, <laughs> and it always seemed to me, you know, I would, I would always – if we ever pass an amusement park anywhere, to this day I'll stop and look at the landscape and wonder how it got there, who built it, who goes there. And all that sort of remained. I, I wrote a book on the history of the Catskills. The publisher said, what do you want to do next? We had a Rondex. And I said, you have me all wrong. I'm not a nature boy. I like fake reality. I like mm. plunging into fantasy. I like amusement parks. And, and, and then, you know, it, it, I still didn't know. Where did they start? I'd heard of Pleasure Gardens in England. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I knew uh, in Chicago, Riverview Park, uh, is just beloved, uh, and it, although it closed in 1967, people still talk about it. Uh, just as they do, uh, every town seemed to have an, its own amusement park. Well, I did learn there were 2,000 at one point in America, and every town did have one. They were built by the railroad barons to keep the trolley cars running. They were called mm-hmm. trolley parks, and you would ride to the end of the line, and that's where. These electronic monstrosities, <laughs> wonderlands, really, were. People's homes were not wired for electricity. Then they'd go to these places. Not only was electricity running the rides, but it would li- brilliantly light up the skies. So you can you know, just imagine the draw. And then they fell out of favor. People had had th- their fill. What killed them at first was the Model T. Once everyone could afford his own car, you didn't need to go on a ride to get a thrill. You could provide your own behind the wheel. The other thing was the movies came in. And for a nickel, you could just enter another world and sit in the dark and make out. Yeah. Well, it's... To combat that, way, just to take one more step and and then we'll get back to conversing. Um, the, The entrepreneurs who took over from the railroad barons they thought, how are we going to attract a crowd? Well, that's what brought about the golden age of the roller coaster, because that was a supersized thrill that your Model T could not provide. Right. The, the depression plunged the parks, you know, killed off business. They sort of revived again uh, during the war because it was a place uh, soldiers on leave could take their dates. And then after the war, television came in and really killed them off because you could – Kids could see Howdy Doody and the Hopalong Cats and the Three Stooges on television. That was their amusement until Walt Disney figured, I'll use television for something clever. I'll sell my park, and my park will be different. It will be clean, and the world will come. And people laughed at him, and we know who had the last laugh. It will be clean. It will not have prostitutes. That's... They'll be outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although some did, some would say today that Disney uh, as a corporation is – well, we won't go there. So, um, the, speaking once we finish talking. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of roller coasters, um, obviously the, the the first part of the book I found so fascinating because you go into the history of sort of royal indulgence in Europe and and fairs yeah. and and the all of the antecedents to theme parks that were sort of from these from these monarchs who had all of these various uh, eccentricities. 
And then there's Catherine the Great, who basically in the in the, in the 18th century uh, was the first person to basically create or, or or to endow a roller coaster. Talk about that for a second. Well, the Russians were always crazy about sledding, but they weren't satisfied just to you know take a hill. They would build on a wooden plank. And, and this included the peasants, you know, whatever scraps of wood they could find. They would build these platforms that would slope, and then they'd toss water on them. In winter, they would freeze, and they would glide down what, the, what they called ice mountains, which came to be called Russian mountains. To this day, in every language but English, a roller coaster is called a Russian mountain. Uh, in Russia, it's called an American mountain, which is funny. Mm. Um, Catherine the Great built this elaborate sl- sledding uh, course, but it was, re- it was a roller coaster at all of her palaces. And uh, the, her sleds were, you know, you didn't, they weren't self-propelled. You were driven, so she would get a handsome cavalier, and she <laughs> positioned herself in his lap and grab both legs and slide down the hill that way. That's so the French funny. saw this during the War of 1812, and they picked up on the notion, and they built these Russian mountains in France, particularly in uh, Parisian pleasure gardens. And they were the ones who put wheels on the coasters, thus giving us roller mm-hmm. coasters. It's just a fascinating history. It really is. Talk uh, for a moment, too, about George Washington Gale Ferris. Uh, the the man for whom the famous Ferris wheel is named such an interesting figure. Uh, yes, well, would I would I be a, a, going a, overboard in saying that he is just as as pivotal a figure in the history of theme parks as Disney or even close? Oh no, I, no. In terms of a particular ride, yes. Okay. Uh, but Disney, no. I, I would say George Tillyu with Steeplechase Park. Uh, as pivotal as Disney, I would say Solomon Bloom with the entire Chicago uh, World's Fair Midway as pivotal. Uh, the two men who developed Luna Park in Coney Island, especially them, right? Uh, uh, Skip Dundee and Fred Thompson, they're on a par with Disney. I mean, nobody's really on a par with Disney, but yeah. you know, you it just seems like everywhere you go, there's a Ferris wheel. It seems to be the yeah, single well, most ubiquitous. Is, this was this was the eccentric engineer who developed it, and it, re- it drove him to disaster, uh, financial, personal, uh, emotionally. He, um, he, he made the deal with the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, and they really cut him a raw deal. Uh, they, whereas in Paris, you know, I, the Eiffel Tower is, it was the symbol of the uh, Paris Exhibition. So Chicago, in 1893, afterwards, wanted its own symbol. And there were suggestions made. Even Eiffel submitted one. But uh, uh, Daniel Burnham, the ar- chief architect of the fair, you know, said to a group of architects in Chicago, you know, what's wrong with you people? You know, why can't you come up with something? And Ferris, who was actually a mechanical engineer based in Pittsburgh, Although his family was from the Midwest, his family was very prominent. His father, grandfather, was instrumental in the founding of the Underground Railroad. His uncle introduced popcorn to Queen Victoria, who then strung it. Anyway, Ferris was a well-educated engineer, and he just supposedly, when uh, Burnham took the architects to task, he just sat down on his napkin at this lunch and drew this enormous wheel, which he could not sell to the fair. They said, you're crazy. No one will ride it. It's too big. It's unsafe. You'll never find the parts. So he had to finance it himself. Uh, In the end, he had to sell off all his rights practically. He... And, the, and no one would ride it initially. It, first of all, it was late. Um, he came up against all sorts of hurdles in constructing it. The fair opened. The wheel wasn't ready. Finally, the wheel opened. Nobody would ride it. But then a terrible storm hit Chicago, and the wheel didn't budge. And, the, you know, that as a result, there was tremendous publicity about that, and the, and the wheel caught on. And the wheel was, then became so profitable that even once the fair closed, the wheel kept spinning for another week. 
the Eric then got offers from all over the world. We'd like to buy your wheel mm. uh, and, and move it. He refused to sell. He insisted it stay in Chicago. He moved it to another park. Nobody wrote it. He went broke. His wife left him. He no longer owned the rights. He ended up dying in a charity ward. He was 37. And the wheel, the, the, the city of Chicago ended up buying the wheel. And, and they... They so have, well, then they sent it off to the 1904 St. Louis World's mm -hmm. Fair where it ran and made more money. And then after the fair closed, again, nobody wanted this original wheel, and it was dynamited. That's just it's such an sad, amazing story. It's a sad story, yeah. And there, and there are – the Ferris wheel, even though he did sell the rights. And, and there, <laughs> are, there are sadly a lot of those stories here of people who – had a dream and and crashed and burned because of it, but we still are the beneficiaries of that dream today. Exactly. Which is, I, well, there was a, one more. If I I'll, yes, I'll speak no. with this one, there was a fellow named Frederick Ingersoll, and he got the idea. Once Luna Park was a tremendous success right. in Coney Island and all over the country, people because of the success of Coney Island and its notorious reputation. Um, all over the country, whether these parks were landlocked or not, they'd call themselves Coney Island. There's, there's one in Cincinnati. Anyway, um, Frederick Ingersoll opened a franchise. All over the world, there were Luna Parks. And, in fact, again, in many countries, an, an, amusement, called, uh, an amusement park is called Luna Park. Well, and there's two that still exist in Melbourne and Sydney. But these were all over the world. In all the major capitals, there were Luna Parks and, and in all the major towns in America. Uh, the one in Berlin did not close until the early 30s. Hitler did not feel amusement parks were necessary. <laughs> uh, <Not> surprising. <laughs> he was a, he was a, a serious fellow. <laughs> and, um, but uh, Ingersoll expanded too quickly. He went belly up. He committed suicide in one of his popcorn stands. She wow. just shut the windows and turned on the gas. You know, you have so many great sidebars in the book as well. And the one that jumped out at me, because I love the ride anywhere I can find it, uh, is the sidebar on bumper cars, which yeah. is, is, is a, it's, it's sort of a microcosm of, of what goes on with theme parks generally in the book. And, and these two fascinating figures, Adair and Stock, it just is shared a little bit. I mean, it's it's really quite a quite a you know a battle, a format battle like Apple versus Microsoft or DVD right. versus or uh, Betamax versus yeah Betamax or, versus yeah, VHS. Yeah, right. It really feels like like one of those. It's fascinating the lawsuits. Talk for just a moment about that. Well, the, the technology was developed for the bumper car, which is basically still the same bumper car we know today. Uh, but there were two warring factions, uh, and I mean. The, Basically put, they bo both sides stole from one another, and it was it was tied up in courts for years. But you know, it did produce. There was a, a standing victor, whichever one it was, whose name escapes me at the moment. But you know, it was a bumpy ride. What can I say? It, it, it's it's just it's so it's so fascinating that uh, so much about patents and. Uh, and, and copyright and uh, and trademark. There's so much uh, of that going on here, and people stealing from each other and imitating each other. It's just it's a it's a wonderful, fascinating world. My last question: so many there's so much passion that drives these people. It never seemed to be, or at least with few exceptions, but it didn't seem to be. Here's a great business opportunity. It's surefire lucrative. These are people who dreamed so big that it, it sometimes took a lifetime to convince others that they weren't crazy. Uh, what, drives, what drove these people? It was a craziness, but I think it was also a, just a, a love for escape. Look, reality is a bore, it, <laughs> and that's being polite. Reality can just do you in. Yeah. And I think, you know, for whatever reasons, the, in, in each individual case, and it was men and women, I mean, there was this wonderful pioneer in Denver, yeah. Mary Elich, and you know, for her, it was a necessity to, you know, her husband got her into this business, and then he died after the first season because he, what he really wanted to do is be an actor, and he left her. Yeah. So she was stuck with with these grounds and, and animals in, in the first zoo owned to be owned by a woman anywhere in the world, 
And, you know, it's sort of, it's the hand you're dealt. Deal with it. And, you know, it was sort of a, a fun notion. But it was also a different notion because they were carving out this new form of recreation. And it was an, you know, they were artists in their way because this had not been done anywhere before. There, it had its roots in Europe. But with each new park that opened, there was some new facet being introduced, whether it was a new ride, whether it was a way of getting people to stand in line, whether, you know, even P.T. Barnum even figured into the equation. Because what he did was sell tickets that allowed people for the first time ever to experience thrills in a group. Mm. So, you know, I can't put my finger on what each of them had other than fortitude and per- persistence. And although, there, you know, there were schemers and dreamers, I say in my stuff. So it's the dreamers that came out ahead. Because yeah. the schemers, if you're out to cheat the public, you failed. Yeah. But, I won't, you know, in most cases, these people were not out to cheat the public. They were out to show the public a good time. Well, it certainly has changed my perspective, and I will be going to Disneyland with my wife and daughter next week uh, to uh, to check out Galaxy's Edge. But I guarantee you, after after the, reading the book, I will not see any of those rides the same way. I'm seeing it all through a completely different prism now, and I thank you for that. It, there's a new appreciation. Um, <laughs> Stephen Silverman, the book is The Amusement Park, 900 Years of Thrills and Spills and the Dreamers and Schemers Who Built Them. And I cannot recommend this highly enough to to our our listeners. Go go to Amazon and grab it, The Amusement Park. It'll be the most enthralling read you will have all year, and it's a great read for the summer. Sit on the beach and read it, and you, you, you won't be able to tear yourself away. Stephen, thank you so much again for the book and for speaking with us. Anytime, Wade, anytime. Thank you.